So why the topic of modern love? Uh, well, modern love, as, as defined by the column, um, is what, what's new about relationships? How has technology changed relationships? Um, how has having um, hundreds of thousands of people that you could date through your phone <laughs> changed relationships? And how have families changed? So that's what we're most, most interested in when we're talking about modern love. So you followed these changes during uh, more than a decade already. Yeah. Which are the major shifts that you witnessed? Uh, some is social acceptance of different kinds of relationships and family relationships. Um, the pace at, at which gay marriage um, became the law of the land in the United States happened so fast. Um, and it, it really paved the way for, um, for different kinds of relationships to be seen as acceptable. Uh, and different, um, you know, people weren't so judgmental about uh, people's choices when it came to love and people's identities in, in terms of how they formed relationships, who they fell in love with, how they formed families, um, and also things like medical technology and how, how you can start a family is dramatically different than it was even you know, 20 or 30 years ago. Um, so, so families are, are new in that way. So what's new more particularly? I mean, is, are people more tolerant? Uh, I find that people are more, more tolerant, much more tolerant. And people who are uh, younger than 30 are especially more tolerant than college students today. In fact, uh, a, a change even in the last few years, at least in the United States, is that people don't like to, to put labels on relationships. They don't even like to call a relationship a relationship. Um, they don't use terms like boyfriend and girlfriend like they used to. And everything seems more fluid in that way. Um, that's not all for the good. Sometimes people don't know what defines the beginning of a relationship and the end because they haven't really put a name to it. Um, but these are all things that people are sorting out. And what about technology? How did it shape the new relationships between people? Well, technology, at least through phones and dating apps, um, has, has given us so many choices for how to, how to meet people. Um, in some cases, people are overwhelmed by that amount of choice. Uh, I think it's made a lot of people think um, there's always someone better. Um, no matter who they're with, there's always someone better because they can pull their phone out of their pocket and there may be a thousand people that, whose profiles they can look at. Um, so I think it's, in some cases, there's a lot, there's, the choice is good. Um, but in other cases, I think it makes people anxious and, and unhappy. What about taboo topics? Were there any taboo topics that now are very familiar to us? Well, I think people are, are, are uncomfortable with things that are, are unusual um, until you can put a name and a face to that. That's true with, um, you know, uh, with um, Bruce Jenner and now <laughs> going through um, a sexual transition. That was unheard of by most people um, even 10 or 20 years ago. And now that's entered the mainstream through, through television and celebrity. Um, we've run several essays in the Modern Love column that talk about people who are, who are transgender. And once you hear someone's voice telling you their story, I think it makes it understandable. So those sorts of taboos are, are falling away. What about politics? Did anything change after the election of President Trump? Uh, what I've seen in stories, uh, Trump is a polarizing figure. He, um, his supporters love him, and everybody else really seems to hate him. And, and that divide has, has shown up in relationships. Some, some stories I've seen, um, people were, were surprised to learn that their boyfriend, girlfriend, husband, wife even, had voted for Trump. And these relationships ended uh, over, over that. Um, it, it has made, I think, the Trump phenomenon, which is, is kind of toxic in a lot of ways because there's, there's sort of a meanness to the politics now. Um, with the younger generation, I think it's made them more, want to be more tolerant, want to make up for that, that meanness that they see rising 
uh, in the United States and in other places too. And they want to they, they want to be more tolerant as a result of that, and more accepting and more kind. That's a good news. Yeah. What about um, the most popular stories? What topics did they approach during this yeah. time? Yeah, modern love is not an advice column, but there there are lessons to be learned in reading the stories. The, the most popular sto stories by far are ones that um, give people advice through the story about how to find love or how to keep it. Um, Can you share such uh, examples sure. of advices? Um, the, the most popular story that we, we've ever run was called To Fall in Love with Anyone Do This. And it was by a woman named Mandy Len Catron. And she had read a psychological study where if you ask each other on a first date with a stranger, these 36 questions, 36 six specific questions that were created by a psychologist and then stared into each other's eyes for four straight minutes, which is a long time to stare into each other's eyes, uh, that you have a good chance of falling in love. And she did. Uh, she did with this man. And that column was published. I think it was read by close to 20 million people. But they were deep questions, right? They were not superficial. And they that were was increasingly, the they went in three sets. And they were designed to make each person equally vulnerable. So they would get increasingly probing about your past and what, what was the worst experience in your life. Uh, what's your relationship with your mother? Um, and they also involved parts where, where they required each person to flatter the other person and say um, three things they really liked about that person already. And it turns out that it makes people feel really good to have a stranger say really nice things about them. <laughs> and, and it just created chemistry between two people that, uh, that made, if not love more possible, um, understanding and, um, and just affection. I know that it entered also pop culture, uh, this, this story, in different ways. Yeah. So speaking of pop culture, I was curious, did you find by talking and by reading stories from tens of thousands of people, did you find information that was in contradiction or debugged some myths that were promoted otherwise by pop culture or even by pop psychologists? Well, I, when you talk about myths and love, um, I, there's, a, there's a fantasy element and a romantic element of love that I, I hope that the whole column um, debunks in a way. I, I think a lot of relationships, long-term relationships, fail because there's such, a, there's such a fantasy that love is a purely a good thing and that, that if you're in love, um, that's all it takes to to have a relationship work out. And the fact is there are a lot of practical things and compat compatibility issues in long-term relationships where you have to fight it out, you know, and you have to um, negotiate. And uh, I, what, I, what I like about the column and what um, I think the impact it has is it talks about real love and real, real practical um, long-term love and what it takes and tries to, 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 to push aside the fact that love is a fantasy and that as soon as you fall in love you've got it made because you don't you know things are going to happen can you give me some examples of stories that moved you or maybe even haunting you now the stories that move me the most are are the ones where people have really gone through something incredibly difficult um, and i'll give you an example that there's a woman who a, a, a couple who could not have their own children and they adopted a girl from China, an infant girl from China, and uh, fell in love with her picture on their refrigerator for eight months or something before they could go adopt her. They, they wind up in China, and it turns out this girl has um, severe medical problems, including had had, a, had back spinal surgery that the doctor said were going to leave her paralyzed for life. And the, the solution to this was to exchange her for another child. And they said, no, you know, we can't, we can't just exchange this girl for, an, for another child. Um, and they, they left with that girl. And she had, did have medical problems for about a year, but then turned out to be fine. But it was the, it's those stories that have that kind of choice. What are you going to do? Are you going to, to do what, um, what is right? Are you going to um, react from fear? 
and back away. The stories where, where people are really confronted by choice are, are really compelling to me. Because love usually conquers all. You have a saying. I don't know if it always does. You know, it did in this case. Um, it's nice to think that it, that it does, but a question, a, 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 an essay like that, I put myself on the woman's shoes and think, would I choose a healthy child or would I choose the child that they'd promised would be um, disabled for her entire life? I think it makes readers face that choice as well. And um, it, it's good to think about those kinds of things because you never know what you're going to do until you're in that situation. But if love does not conquer all, and it doesn't, it didn't, and it doesn't, uh, how do we relate to love nowadays? What is modern love for us? How, how is it different? In my personal life? Or? If you would <laughs> like, yes, I, please. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm mostly humbled by, um, by what people are dealing with. I, I, I feel like I have this window into, um, into so many lives that represent so many other lives and, and that nobody, it's so easy in this age of social media to, to look, at, look at other people's lives in envy and think, oh, they really have it made. They have the good job and they have the good relationship and they post their, picture, their vacation pictures. Um, I feel like I know the lie that that is because I see all of these stories that everybody is dealing with something. And in some cases, it's a severe medical problem. It's, the, it's lost love from the past. Um, it's anxiety about finding somebody. And I, I feel like we need to give everybody a break <laughs> because everyone is dealing with something. No, nobody, nobody has it made. And that, tr that, that really comes through in these stories. What about the topic of sex? How do you get around it? Uh, did things change during uh, these years? Is it approached? Which are the boundaries? Um, what's interesting about young people today, and I, I see this uh, in college students who write for the column or people who are in their early 20s especially, they, um, they don't so much consider sex as part of a relationship. They consider sex as something you get on the side and it is, can, be outside of a, can be outside of the relationship. Um, often people who are in, in college or in their 20s don't want a relationship to be a whole relationship. They want it to be a piece. So they'll get friendship from, from their friends. They'll get intimacy, um, emotional intimacy from, um, from a friend or from family. And they'll get sex from someone else because um, they, don't, they don't want someone to marry. They don't want a relationship to be the most important thing in their lives. Not until they're in their late 20s are they really looking for that. So, so many young people in, in the States, um, and I imagine elsewhere, uh, sex is um, something that's fun, but not part of <laughs> a full relationship often. Not, not with everybody, but that's definitely something that I see happening more and more. What makes a good essay? I think in a good essay of this kind, you have to be vulnerable, you, you, um, and you have to be smart. So it, the story you tell has to reveal something really deep and troubling about yourself. But then you have to come to some conclusion about what that means. Um, so for example, uh, one essay I loved a lot was a, a woman who learned for her and her husband, marriage had, had been sort of a safe space. Love was sort of a safe space and they because they both had troubled childhoods. And so um, they thought their marriage was a place where you shouldn't fight. And their marriage fell apart because they couldn't fight. And they couldn't, they couldn't work through problems because they thought that would mean arguing. And their marriage fell apart. And, and she realized after, after the, um, the marriage ended, what, a, what real love was, and that real love had to involve conflict because it just had to involve someone you can fight with. And that's the sort of um, vulnerability in talking about why your marriage failed combined with intelligence of being able to figure out a lesson from it. About how many essays did you read? We receive about eight, eight or 9,000 essays a year and we publish 52. 
So um, it's a lot of stories that we're sifting through to find those stories that we publish. And how, how did it change you at a personal level and professional level as well? Well, most of these essays come from women. Um, about s probably 80% of them come from women. So my wife likes to joke that, um, that it's made her, me understand her a lot better. <laughs> and has made me understand uh, women a lot better. But I, but I also understand um, men. And, you know, men, women in these, uh, in these stories are much more eager to criticize men than men are to criticize women. Um, men don't really want to go there. And I'm not really sure why. I think they're afraid to. I think they're afraid in print to criticize women. So men's pieces, essays, can be more self-examining and self-critical. And women's essays um, have that, but they're also willing to go and uh, be more aggressive and go at men and say, you did this wrong and you need to, <laughs> you need to do it better next time. Um, so you are the editor of Modern Love. You have a pod podcast. Right. You wrote books uh, on this topic. What are you planning to do next? Uh, well, there's, there's a TV show in the works um, called Modern Love, and uh, we'll see what happens with that. But that um, has been a project that's been going on for about a year. Um, the other thing that we're doing with podcasts, with the podcast, which has been really exciting, is, is taking that podcast to the stage and doing it in live shows. Um, where the actors come, come to the stage and we have a band and they read, read the stories out loud to a live audience. We did this in New York and Boston and hope to do that in more places. But mostly I'm interested in, in I, I like how these stories um, move people and enlighten them. And uh, any, any way, people get their, their stories from different places all the time. They take in media from different places, and that, that's changing so fast. So I like, I like how the, the column has expanded beyond print into all these other ways. So you, you have the same stories, but they're being told in, in whole new ways, and people are access, accessing them in whole new ways. Um, that's exciting to me, and I, and I just hope that continues, and I look forward to seeing how it continues. What is the feedback of the readers? What are they most interested in, or how do they impact them in ways that uh, matter and they feel the need to, to saying it? Well, the column is very popular on social media, and mm -hmm. the, most of the conversations I follow uh, happen on Facebook, and they get shared um, you know, tens of thousands of times on, on Facebook. And, uh, it's those sorts of conversations where you see how um, people see themselves in the stories or see others and start tagging their friends and saying, oh my God, did you, did you, did you read this? Um, I don't know. I've heard, because the, because the column has been going on for so long now, almost 13 years, uh, I've heard from people who have grown up on the column, who were 15 when the column started, and now they're 28. And they, they write to me and say, I've lived my whole romantic life with columns as touchstones. There's, a, there's almost a column for every situation <laughs> that anyone has been in. Um, so that makes me feel good that, that it has had that kind of impact in, in people's lives. Because I, I think the column is real in that way and isn't, isn't promoting um, a fantasy about what love is or what life is. So one last question. You have been in this time capsule of uh, relationships, of views and behaviors yeah. in relationships. How do you expect it to evolve in the near future? What can we expect from love relationships between humans? I'm not even sure I have an answer for that. I, I feel like I'm so surprised by um, We've, we've held college contests to hear what college students are dealing with specifically. And each time, we've, we've had that four times over the past 10 years. And each time I thought I knew what the college students were going to be writing about, and I was wrong. <laughs> um, so I'm not a good person to act about, ask about what, what the future holds. Um, but I'm always fascinated with how um, people try to do love better. People try to do relationships better than their parents did. 
um, and how they experiment with relationships to, um, to, to sort of get there and to sort of improve upon what's happened in the past. The feelings will always, I think, be the same. Um, but the ways we find love and the ways we maintain it seem to change um, at this point from year to year. Thank you very much for joining us and for the explanations. Thank you very much. Vă mulțumesc și dumneavoastră că ne-ați urmărit. Sunt Laura Ștefanuț și găsiți întreaga înregistrare pe digi24.ro.